I caution Dodd Sterling that that's one of the songs you got to be careful in singing that song because you're putting a declaration out there. And if don't nobody else hear it, God hears it. So to put it in our vernacular, if you woke up this morning, you had no doubt he was going to take care of you. Then when something going wrong, why are you tripping? You say you didn't have no doubt. So why are you acting like you acting? Our scripture has been read, but before I get into it, let me take care of some pulpit protocol pleasantries. I want to say thank you to Pastor Singleton for the opportunity to come here and to share a word of God with you. One of the things that we know being in North Georgia, and particularly in the North Georgia Annual Conference, there is no shortage of preachers. There are preachers. The North Georgia Annual Conference got preachers on hold. These are preachers who have been certified and they don't have a church yet because there's more pastors than there are churches to put them in. So when Pastor Singleton asked me, I was honored. And then when I saw who I was following, that's why I was here last night. I told him, I said, I came to see which way you were going to pass the baton. Was it overhand or underhand? I need to see which way I was supposed to grab it. <laughs> I have such love and respect for Pastor Thompson. He and I have been friends for a number of years, and being the military man that I am, I can say about Brother Thompson and Brother Singleton, if I had to be in the foxhole with somebody, these are the two I'd want to be in with. So I am, I am grateful for the friendship that we share. I uh, want to recognize the members of Dodd Sterling who uh, braved that, we can't even call that a real rain, is it? What, what was that, a light, a light sprinkle, a, a, a heavy, heavy dew? A <laughs> okay. Uh, Dodd Sterling, I'm going to ask you to stand, wave your hand, or let the folk know how, okay? I am grateful. You know, in, in, in every church, Pastor Singleton, you have a group of what they call the core members. These are the ones that you know you can count on. These are the ones that you say, look, I'm going, and they say, what time we need to be there? Where is that? They don't get into no detail other than that. So I am, I am grateful that they came out tonight to be with us. And they're, they're, they're doing double duty this week because we got the revival tonight and we got Bible study tomorrow night. And so I let them know that just because you come to this don't mean that exempt you from that. Okay. Matter of fact, I, I consulted one of, the, one of the ministers at the church. I said, you think I ought to cancel Bible study because we're going to revive? She said, oh, no, Pastor. Ooh, said we didn't got into a routine. In my former line of work, that's called a battle rhythm. If it's rolling and it's working, don't stop it now because you might not get it started again. Amen? So I'm so grateful for them being here. And I kind of shared with Pastor Thompson last night that, you know, it was appropriate for him to say what he said about his first lady, his better half. And so I'm not going to be outdone. <laughs> I want y'all to know that she's the butter pecan in my ice cream.
And that's saying something because you're looking at a real life ice cream holic. <laughs> I tell them I'm not in therapy, I don't go to meetings. Okay? She's the, she's the butter on my popcorn. When, when you, we, we, we just celebrated uh, last Sunday of uh, last month, <clears throat> we just celebrated 18 years of marriage. <clears throat> and, and as we were celebrating, we uh, had the conversation with each other, says, 18 years ago, did you think it was going to be like this? And we both said, we knew it would be good. Just didn't know it would be this good. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I will be preaching or I'll, I'll be teaching and I'll say something about Paula and there. And I had this one person say, you sound like you henpecked. I said, I ain't hitting peck. I'm just pecked by the right hand. <laughs> as, the, as the folk will say, I know what side my bread buttered on. <laughs> But you know, that's, again, that's one of the reasons why we love your pastor and first lady so much because a lot of times we go out and fellowship just the four of us, okay? And, you know, if you want to be like, you know, if you want to be something, associate with people who are what you want to be. Huh? And, and, and we, we go out and we make sure that they put us over in a corner because... You see, he ain't the smallest guy, which means that when he get excited, he laughs. And we want folk to know everything all right. He, he, ju he just happy. <laughs> but we, we, we count it such a, such a blessing to be here because, like I said, there, there are so many preachers that he could have asked. And the fact that he asked me I, I have shared with people that there is no higher honor for me than to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no higher honor that I, all of my accolades in the military and all the other stuff I've done, it doesn't compare to being a child of God and being given the breath, blessed privilege of representing him. So I'm grateful for that. We have, again, we have read the scripture, and on your bulletin, it says the unbelievable Jesus. That's a typo. There is an un, but it's not believable. It's the uncomfortable Jesus. The uncomfortable Jesus. Okay? People today... They want to see persons who are living Christianity in the world. They don't care about what you're talking about. Because a lot of us know we can make our mouths say anything. But the world is looking for people to live Christianity. They are hungry to see the body of Christ at work and involved. One of the reasons that we don't have the involvement in church that we had when a lot of us were growing up. It's because of something called church hurt. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's church hurt. And it's where the church has hurt people. Okay? People come into the church looking for certain things, and they come in and they don't find what they're looking for. Instead, they find something else. And they virtually say, you know what, if you're going to talk about me like that in here, I can stay at home. Ain't no reason for me to get dressed up and come here and talk about me 
Because, see, I know how the folk do in the world. I expect that. But when I come here, I expect it different. Study after study and survey after survey brings us to the same results, that the people of the world have a strong passion, perhaps more than ever, to be involved in something important, something bigger than themselves. Perhaps that's one reason why we see so many people becoming passionate about the ecological system and universal health care, because they, they find that they need to be involved in something. Perhaps that's why during the 1960s there was a powerful anti-establishment movement that was rallied by young people and hippies, as they came to be called. People wanted to be passionately involved in something that makes a difference. Now, even though the years have changed, that has not changed. People still want something to be passionately involved in, and they want to make a difference. Believe it or not, the people in this world know that the world is broken. As a little boy would say, <laughs> they know it ain't right. There are things going on that's not supposed to be going on. So what are they to do? They have all this energy. They have all this passion. And what is it? How do they deal with it? We've seen in our gospel lesson that was read this evening that Jesus was passionate big time. Jesus' mission was huge. And when he told the powers to be that there were many widows who had not been taken care of, that there were many in Israel with leprosy, yet none of them were healed and taken care of, and that it was basically the fault of the establishment, well, that made the people mad, really, really mad. It's very much like when we tell Congress, y'all ain't doing nothing. Y'all have the power to make laws. Y'all have the power to change things. And all you're doing is making it worse for the folk who don't have nothing and making it so much better for the folk who got everything. Are you aware that we pay for, the, for Congress's health care? And they're trying to cut our health care? They don't even pay into Social Security. There are benefits that they get that all you got to do is get to office, be elected for one term, and you collect a pension for the rest of your life. I was looking on Facebook the other day, and they were showing how, like, six of the eight Republicans who voted for this guy that just became a Supreme Court judge are 83 and above. They ought to be somewhere sitting down, at least trying to rock in a chair. <laughs> Jesus let folk know that what you're doing is not right. And he told them in such a way that they, they got mad, but what else could they do? As we just read, all the people in the synagogue, were, they were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove him out of town, they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off. But that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus walked right through the crowd and went on his way. He wasn't going to allow these people to ruin or to stop his mission, the most important mission in the world. Brothers and sisters, that's a lesson that we can take. Don't let folk tell you what you're doing for God is not right, particularly when God has told you to do it. This is why this message is entitled, The Uncomfortable Jesus. Because, see, Jesus made the people uncomfortable. If you, if you remember, as Pastor Singleton read, it said that he read, gave it back to them. And they looked at him. And he looked at them like, what you looking at me for? I'm telling you that what I read is about to happen. He wasn't intimidated by other people. I remember hearing about a young preacher who was fresh out of seminary, and he had become convicted of some injustice, and he decided to take it upon himself to do what he felt God called him to do. So he went around knocking on doors to engage 
people about whatever atrocity that he was trying to get the people rallied around. And one day he knocked on this person's door and they were impressed. And this person mentioned this to their senior pastor. And the senior pastor simply said with a sigh and a waving of the hand, he's young. He'll learn. And pretty soon, I guess he did. Because before long, he had fallen in line and given up on the radical Christianity that Christ had called him to do. Think back on your salvation. Think back when you were first saved. Think about how, particularly if you've been to annual conference, but when, when we baptize somebody, part of, the, part of it says, remember your baptism. Not to so much get involved in this, but remember your baptism. Remember how Jesus made you feel. Remember how you told him you go through hell and high water for him. Remember how you told him that you would never leave him nor forsake him. You told him all the stuff that he told you. But then you began to realize that that was some radical Christianity that you were talking about. I want you to understand that Jesus' mission was not easy. Jesus was the most radical revolutionary to ever walk this earth. And the things that he said and did got people mad. I mean, really mad. I mean, got them to that level that I can't even, you, you, know, you know, there's a word when you really, give me, you, you say you, but you can't say that word in church. But that's how mad they got. That's how mad they got. But thanks be to God, Jesus had very thick skin. Are you aware that as disciples of Jesus Christ that we are called to live a radical life? We are not called to fit in like everybody else. If you're running with some folk and you don't fit in, be grateful to God that you don't fit in. I tell folk all the time, we fail to realize that God called Jesus, came to live our life and die our death so we could be a thumb, not fingers. You always got a lot of fingers, but he called us to be thumbs. What does that mean? That means we don't fit in with everybody else. You could virtually hear God saying, stop saying to the thumb, stop trying to be a finger. You don't fit in. You ain't long enough. You, 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 you don't eat, you fatter than the rest of them. You, you don't fit. That's God's way of saying, stop trying to be like everybody else. Be who God made you to be. If he made, he made you to be a thumb, then be a thumb. And don't worry about that, because one thumb will hook up with the other thumb. <laughs> huh? And have you noticed that the hand cannot really be the hand? Okay, you got that. You got that. Hmm? I don't care what that hand does. That hand cannot grip without the thumb. That thumb has a very distinct purpose. The fingers are virtually saying to the thumb, stop trying to be like us. Be what you're supposed to be. There's a story that I've told about when I was in the Army. I was in a recruiting station. And I was overdoing my work. In the, and there were some other recruiters over there that were, uh, they were laughing and talking. And they were talking about drinking. This is the most non-alcoholic guy God ever put on the planet. So they over there, they're talking about drinks and stuff, you know. And they're talking about rum and coke, you know. And I'm thinking, I can, I can get in this conversation, you know. I, you, know. you know, and I said, you know, I said, I said, yeah. I said, when you, the rum and coke, I said, you, you put Barcard I in the coke. And they say, what? They say, what? I said, Barcard I. 
I said, you know, that's a, that's a rum. They said, Sergeant Paul, shut up. <laughs> and stay on your side of the office. They knew I was a Christian. They said, you ain't got no business in this conversation. Stay over there and do your work and stay out of this conversation. Pastor Singleton, I'm up there thinking, I'm saying, you know, I'm over there hooked on phonics. <laughs> Let me know. Stop trying to be something that you're not and be what you're supposed to be. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to live a radical life. We're called as well to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppression, and then to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, you know, this sounds good on paper. It sounds good when he preach it. It sounds good when you hear it in Sunday school. It sounds good in Bible. You know, it even sounded good last night when Pastor Thompson preached from low living to the, to the high life. Yeah, everybody wants the high life. But you don't want to go through what it takes to get there. When it comes to putting Jesus' words into practice, that's a whole other story altogether. But that isn't what it means to be the body of Christ living out our faith in this world. For you see, being a Christian is messy business. It doesn't, it doesn't fit into a neat box well. It kind of oozes all out. If you're a true Christian, don't you know that you can't be a Christian just at church? Because if you're a true child of God, that's going to come out at work. Something going to happen at work, and you ain't going to say PTL. You know, PTL is what the incognito Christians say. But if you're a child of God and something happens, you're going to say praise the Lord. And you're going to catch somebody off God. Excuse me, I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, no, praise the Lord. Somebody said, oh, you know, something happened. Oh, you're, well, I was lucky. Oh, no, 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 you were blessed. You were blessed. Okay? We should be the very same way the apostle Peter was when he tried to deny Christ. If you remember when he was around the fire, they said to him, no, you one of them. And Peter, oh, no, I'm not one of them. And he denied him. And he even cursed and said, they said, no, you one of them. Your speech betrays you. The way you talk lets us know that you ain't like everybody else. And that's the way we should be, brothers and sisters. We should be making folk uncomfortable. That's why I'm talking about an uncomfortable Jesus. Because Jesus made folk uncomfortable. There's a, there's a story about a pastor, and he had a pastor friend, and they would email their sermons to each other. They would, they would do the draft, and then they would email it to each other, and then they'd make comments. And they both did this every week without fail. And then this one week, the pastor said that, uh, he said, I'm going to send you this, but I'm going to share something special. And so he looked at it, and, and it spoke to him, and he says, I think, you know, I think some of us might be able to relate to this. So the pastor began his sermon like this. I never saw Jesus in my growing up years going to Sunday school the way I see him today in my life. I guess that wasn't in the lesson plans. None of the poster pictures they had came with the lessons showed me a Jesus that disputed things, like temple money changers, cursing the fig tree, calling the Pharisees whitewashed tombs, or saying to his disciples that if they don't like us here, then let's get out of town and shake the dust off your feet. I don't remember Jesus talking to the woman by the well who had had many husbands and Jesus commenting, go and sin no more. I don't remember this Jesus we have 
who went to speak in his hometown, his synagogue, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God was upon him, bringing good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, to the slaves, and even to women, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. Perhaps this world includes women, slaves, Gentiles, Samaritans, the mentally ill, lepers, Oh, you know, we can just go down the whole list. But when I think about it, what kind of Jesus did I learn to know? Well, I quickly say that he was homogenized. He was piousized. He was Sunday schoolized. He was desexed and painted over as the one to be worshipped and adored, but never questioned or even viewed as in any way radical in his talk or in his style. When I was told that he was crucified, I thought it was really going according to God's plan, and I just didn't ask no questions. This pastor says, when I started to really get deep into the New Testament, I found that he was crucified for blasphemy by those who thought that he had come to dismantle the Jewish religion. I never saw any of that before. And the one thing, when I think about it, you know, I graduated from those childhood, adolescent, Sunday school years with a Jesus that wasn't worth much or fit much into a world of a life's pattern. For you see, for me, Jesus was trapped in a kind of Sunday school, nice, meek, mild regalia. When the protest years, and a lot of us sitting here can remember the protest years in the 60s, I didn't see Jesus playing a part in that. I didn't see where he'd fit in. When the Vietnam War and our participation was questioned by many, I didn't see any of my Sunday school or any of my Bible study teachers talking about Jesus anywhere around. How would he fit in anyway? To coin a phrase, this Jesus didn't compute for me. When we think about doing the civil rights movement and we think about how All of that occurred. Folk were asking, where was Jesus doing all this? Where did he fit in? It wasn't until I learned about a Christian pastor by the name of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and how he used something called systematic theology to address all of these and many other issues of his day. I personally share with people, when you study, in, 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 in seminary, I, I took a course entitled The Theology of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I took that a number of years ago, and as I, as I took it, I was in awe then, but as I'm blessed to get older, I'm even more in awe. And one of the things that I share with people is that what's important for us to understand is that what he did was, outside of making folk uncomfortable, because he made everybody uncomfortable. The white folk were scared of him, and the black folk didn't know how to handle him. And you had some folk who say, Martin, now look, now you, 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 you believe too much in your Jesus now. But these white folks, they got guns, and they got dogs, and they got hoses. And, well, Martin, and Martin said, no, it's not right. It can't be the way it is. What made Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King so fantastic, so awesome, is not just that he was a civil rights activist. He was a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He used systematic theology to go to Congress and to change things. He virtually told them, they may be able to still hang us, but they'll go to jail for it. They may still do what they're going to do, but we can find them. 
We can make it difficult for them to mistreat us. And what folks don't realize is that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. changed the law. Because particularly right here in Georgia, it was legal for segregation. It was legal for discrimination. The white folks say, we ain't doing nothing wrong. This is what the law says. Dr. King said, okay. Change the law. And he wasn't scared about doing it. He went all the way up to the White House, got in Lyndon Baines Johnson's face, and said, you can change this. You can change this. All you got to do is change the law. I am sure there were times when President Johnson saw Martin Luther King come, and he said, oh, my God. But there wasn't nothing he could do because he was going to stay right there. And he was going to do what had to be done. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King used systematic theology to address all of these and many other issues of his day. And then I began to read the New Testament again. I read it slowly, carefully. At least I tried. And I began to think about a Jesus that I had never known. This was a Jesus. I saw him moving toward the poor. I saw him moving toward people who had an active theology of God, of war, and of poverty, and of suffering, and oppression. I saw people risking their lives, their reputations, and their safe, secure lives for their Christian faith because they saw a Jesus that some of us had never known existed. Is it not true that we got folk in church who just like to come to church to say they in church? Don't ask them to be on no committee. Amen. Don't ask them to be on no board. Don't ask me to do anything that's going to mess up my flow. Don't have me do nothing the way it requires me to get to church before the other folk do. <laughs> you don't understand. What time service out here? Huh? What, what time service out here? Oh, 11. 11. You don't, you, you don't really, I need to come in at 11.20. So y'all can see me. I'm here now. Service can start. <laughs> I share with Dr. Turner all the time, you know, there's a difference between church folk and disciples of Jesus Christ. Huh? Church folk are the ones that just want to come sit on the pew. I've shared with them, we don't need a pew warmer. That's what we got heat for. It'd be even different if you warmed the whole pew. <laughs> but you just warm the part you sit in. I continue to read and to hear a new gospel that I've never heard before. And I might say, I, I got rather angry, too. Why didn't they tell us about this Jesus in Sunday school? Why didn't they tell us about this Jesus in Bible study? Why aren't they telling us this Jesus from the pulpit? I had been to church all my life, and I didn't hear about this radical, this revolutionary Jesus who was changing everything and making folk uncomfortable. There was a funeral 